Today, I thought we would take a look at this matter we have about the one God business, okay, if I can put it that way. Uh, I think at the center of all religion should be the question of who is God. Uh, and as you go around the globe, uh, those people be uh, uh, people of religion of, of all sorts the the object of their faith uh, is central I think or key and uh, it is for us too it's interesting we are uh, absolutely totally Christian we are followers of Jesus Christ unashamedly and, and that's our hope, that's our faith, that's our, our confidence toward God. And, uh, but we recognize and we realize quite some time back that our understanding about God does differ some from what uh, we often find among our Christians that are out here and, and our fellows out there who are Bible believers, I'll put it that way. And uh, so I thought what I would do this morning is take a little bit of time and maybe just in a overview, look at this question. What are we saying and why are we saying it? Does it make any sense? What's this about? And, uh, and I thought we would look at it from that perspective and then maybe we would accomplish two things. If you, if, this is your faith, as it is mine and actually the, the church here, then it may help clarify your understanding of what we're saying, what you're saying. And it may help you some when you're speaking with a relative, a friend, or explaining a bit about what we believe and how it's different from uh, a lot of, of uh, Christian folks, Christian churches. And, uh, and maybe help them to understand that. Uh, the other thing that we might accomplish this morning, if you're kind of new to this, then maybe it will help you to grasp a little better what we're saying. And uh, whether you agree with us or not, at least you can understand and say, I, I see what you're saying there, I, I've got that. So, uh, so those are our objectives. And I've just written this, it didn't turn out too well. Uh, but this is, there is one God, okay. We've got all sorts of folks around the globe who are making that statement, alleging that. The last part of this is really interesting, though. That's the part that goes to how we're a bit different. And that is, and God is one, okay. One individual. So there's one God, and it is not God is two individuals, not God is three individuals or however many you would like to make him. God is just one. There is one God and God is one. So that could be our mantra, I think. We could, we could say that. Can you sum up your, your faith? That might do it. That would be one way to do it. There is one God and God is only one. Okay. So that's what we're saying. But let's, let's, let's work on this a little bit. And we'll see why we were saying this, or are saying this, rather than there is one God. And as many of our Christian friends would say, they would say, and God is three. Hmm, interesting idea. Uh, but we're saying, no, no, God is just one. Only one individual is God. And that's what we're wanting to think about. Okay, so let's, uh, let's just begin. And... Our understanding in these matters is absolutely scripturally based. In other words, we're not interested in just our thoughts or our ideas or some uh, purely philosophical notion in that sense. That's not what we're pursuing here. We're pursuing and basing our faith on biblical understanding. What really is said in the Bible? And you say, well, the Bible then 
we, you know, it would, why would there be difference? And I think maybe we could look at it this way. Uh, I don't know how many words are in the Bible, how many pages are in your typical Bible, but a lot. And as it turns out, if any time you can get more than one word on a page, people can argue over it so, or come up with ideas about it, right? Maybe even one word on a page. So people come up with a lot of different perspectives out of this. They can't all be right because often they are at odds with one another. They can't possibly all be right. That doesn't make sense. Okay. So, well then, you hear this sometimes, well, you can prove anything by the Bible. That's not really true. That's an inaccurate statement. You can't prove anything by the Bible, not really in that sense. You can allege anything by the Bible, I guess. You could read or read any portion or part of it and then say this and that, that whatever suits you. You can do that. But to prove anything by the Bible, not at all. The only thing we could really truly prove by the Bible would be those things that the Bible intended to begin with. Uh, as we've said before, when you read your Bible, what we're doing is we're, we're looking at something that was spoken or written by others some time ago. And to understand it, you need to understand it in the way they would have understood it or the way that God would have wanted the people to uh, that were reading or hearing those words to, to have understood it then. So we want to know what did they mean by what they said? What were they saying and what did they mean by it? And I think today, uh, too often, I said this recently, but too often people go at it backwards. I go in and say, oh, look, I'm reading this verse here and what does that mean to me? Well, wait a minute, wait a minute. Don't get ahead of things. What did it mean to the person who wrote it? You answer that question first. And what did it mean or should it have meant to the people who were reading it to begin with? Answer that first. Then after that, you can begin to think, okay, now what should this mean to me? How does this work? So if we don't approach it that way, we go backwards and then we're reading ourselves into the Bible instead of reading the Bible for our own, for our benefit, for our instruction, right? So that's important, very important. So anyway, here's what we're saying. There is one God, and we have a lot of folks that would say that, billions of people around the world will say that. It's the last part that we're saying that's a bit different, and we understand that, and that is God is only one individual. He's not two or three. There's not multiple gods. There's not more than one who is truly God, like as in God of the universe. And there is only one individual who is that one God. So that's, that's what we're thinking. So I thought we'd get a look at this. Where, where are we coming from on this? We said our, our interest is biblical. We're only concerned about what the Bible really did say and teach. What did they believe? You know, we, we don't want to go by what we think. We want to go by, well, wait a minute, what did they think? The people who wrote this, what were they thinking? Okay. So... Very important verse, Deuteronomy, the sixth chapter, and verse four. And if you, if you would this morning, we're not going to cover a lot of scriptures, uh, but they're all important. Make notes of these scriptures and write them in your Bible or in your notepad or whatever you have, because I think you can take these scriptures we're going to look at in the next few minutes, and just by relying on those few scriptures, you can help people better understand what we're saying uh, on these matters. So Deuteronomy 6 and 4, Hear, O Israel. Hear, O Israel. The Lord is our God, the Lord alone. Hey, this sounds like it's our idea, doesn't it? There is one God, and God is one, and now we discover here that he has a name, we may not be entirely sure how to pronounce that now. But anyway, Yahweh perhaps, we'll say. And uh, people are going to nearly uh, beat each other up over how you say that. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. Not now. Anyway, so this one who is God, 
He is Yahweh, and he is Yahweh alone, right? Okay. So I think the, this is the one that we're looking at, and actually say, well, the other view, maybe he, there is a couple of others with him. But that doesn't really allow for that, does it? This, the view that has come along that says God is multiple individuals, two or three individuals, that, that doesn't work because there's only one. The Lord alone is our God. He was the only one who was their God, right? And, and that should be the case with us then. So Yahweh, okay. He is the one who is God. Now, this is your second verse. And like I say, unless you're familiar with these offhand, write them down. They may help you to just sit down and work your way through these matters with somebody. But, but in Nehemiah, and I really like this, in the ninth chapter in verse 6, there's a very important statement here about this business of Yahweh. Okay. And that is this, and Ezra said, you are the Lord, you are the Lord, this is Yahweh, okay, you are the Lord, you alone. So you are Yahweh, he's speaking to one individual, and he's saying you are Yahweh, you alone. So there is actually only one individual then who is Yahweh, only one individual who is God, and he's the one that Ezra is addressing in Nehemiah 9 and verse 6. Yahweh is God. He is God alone. He's the only one who is God to those people back there. And he is only one individual. Okay. Not two, not three, not many, many more. Okay. Uh, I even uh, read an interesting article written by uh, this fellow from uh, India, okay, and Brother Dale could advise us in all these matters, but it was interesting. He was making the case for there are many gods in India just actually really kind of being one god. Well, isn't that kind of fudging? <laughs> How many gods do they have? How many deities of whatever sorts do they have? Actually, they have bunches, it would seem. From, for all practical purposes. And, but he's saying, well, you know, there's a sense in which they're all just one. Well, that's kind of a, what a magic trick, isn't it? We got here dozens, hundreds, maybe, I don't know how many they have, thousands, but of gods. They got a god for everything, okay? But now we're gonna say, yeah, you got all them gods, and say, oh, well, you know, it's kind of like abracadabra. They're just one. There's only one who's God. Well, okay, well, that's nice that you said that because we never would have imagined it if you hadn't just said it. So, but the Bible is giving us a picture of one who is God, and he is Yahweh, and he was their only one who was God. And we know there's only one who is Yahweh, right? Okay, so I like that. You alone, that's the point. You are the Lord. You are Yahweh. You alone. And you have made the heavens. All of this is singular. You have made the heaven, the heaven of heavens, with all their hosts, the earth and all that's on it, the seas and all that is in them. Wow, to all of them you give life and the host of heaven. Wow. So what do you think? There's only one individual who is Yahweh, only one individual who is God, there's only one individual then who has made the heavens. You did this, okay? And you are the ones who, are, who, is, who is God over all the earth. And I like that. Well, these scriptures have our attention. We've noticed a lot that a lot of our Christian friends are not even aware hardly of these scriptures. They, they, don't, they don't think of it. But boy, aren't they big? They're huge, aren't they? These are great, great statements of faith that are here in place 
before uh, Jesus Christ actually even comes on the scene. These things are in place. Now, we're going to ask this question then. Did Jesus come and change that? Or did he come and illuminate it in a different way? And say, oh, no, really, it just seems like there's one, but actually there's more than one who is God. And the answer to that is he didn't. And we know because he addresses this question directly. So let's take a look in Mark, the 12th chapter, if you will, in verse 28, 29. And again, these are easy things this morning. We're not, we're not doing anything that, that is difficult to grasp, I think. Okay. So now we're looking at Jesus. And he is speaking. He's doing some public speaking, as it were. And now in, uh, in verse 28, one of the scribes, one of the Jewish scribes there, came near and heard them disputing with one another. Speaking out the people who had been talking to Jesus, right? He heard them disputing and all this business. And seeing that he answered them well, seeing that Jesus had answered them well, and the questions that had been posed so far to Jesus, he answered them well. This fellow comes along and says, he came and he said, well, I'll ask him something then. And he asked him, which commandment is first of all? What's the greatest? Of all? That would be a really interesting question to pose, wouldn't it? Because it looks to me like you're, you're kind of pushing Jesus into a bit of a corner. Because when you say one is greater than another, then that's saying these others are not as big as this one. Or these others are not as good as that one. And so I really think it was a very good question, I'll put it that way, very interesting question, is going to do as he most often did. He cuts through all of the nonsense and gets to the heart of the matter and gets right down to it. So then in uh, verse 29, Jesus answered and he says immediately, he doesn't have to wonder, he doesn't stammer, he doesn't have a question. He said, the first is, wow, the first is, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. This is actually a quotation of the verse we were just reading earlier in Deuteronomy 6 and verse 4. What is Jesus saying? Jesus is not only affirming that there's only one who is God. He's not only affirming that Yahweh is the only one who is God and that there's only one who is Yahweh, but he's also going a step further and saying that's the greatest of all the commandments. Isn't that interesting? And he says that without fear of successful, you know, contradiction, I suppose. And they, then they couldn't really contradict it because this one's tough. This one is like the umbrella. You get who God is right. And you get this squared away, you get it straight about God, and then everything else falls right after that. Because now you know what, which God to listen to, right? You know which God is living and, the, and is, is the God to serve. Now you know what God we're talking about. And uh, if, you, if you pray, you know which God to pray to. And you know when you receive an answer to prayer, you know which God to thank. So isn't that interesting? So the first is, Jesus says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is not two, not three, not hundreds, just one. He is one. And, and I think that's tremendous. Okay. So now we have Jesus then not only affirming these things, but he is actually clarifying that this is the greatest commandment of all. Okay. So, isn't it interesting then that Jesus, when he says this is the greatest of the commandments, when it said first, it didn't mean like first in terms of time exactly. It means first in terms of priority. Which comes first? What's the greatest? And, uh, and that's what uh, Jesus is, is doing here. Wow. So we've looked at three short passages of Scripture 
But how much does this unfold for us? I think it unfolds the key. I said earlier that you could make all sorts of things out of the scripture. You can say, you can say, I'll, I'll say it this way. There's thousands of words there. I'll, I'll do this. How do we actually say what's going on for real? I think you have to find the threads that run through this that are those threads of truth. What's the real foundation? If you're talking to a friend about our faith, your friend may do what I call scripture hopping. And it's not necessarily that they intend anything bad by it, but they mean, hey, I'm going to go over this scripture, and then we're going to go over that scripture. And first thing you know, they've been in 16, 17, 27 scriptures. And it, they're all different points, and they're trying to establish a multi-person God, perhaps. These are scriptures they think do that. But I think what we can do that's just much better than all of that is we can get to the foundation pieces. I'm never going to come to a conclusion that there's several who are one God when I have these as my foundational scriptures. When I'm looking at the scriptures and I'm looking at the scriptures we've just read, they're laying out a framework for us that if I get outside of that framework, I know I'm, I'm goofed up. I'm, I'm all on the wrong track somewhere. So actually, Deuteronomy 6 and 4 then, Nehemiah 9 and 6, Mark 12, 29 in particular, and others, that locks it in. Now, let me say this. We're not alone in having then reached the conclusion that there is only one God and God is one. Some people refer to that as absolute monotheism. Okay. So if that's true, then we are absolute monotheists. Okay. We don't, we don't goof with the monotheism and play games like saying, oh, well, guess what? There's only one God, but he is several hundred different gods, okay? Or even two or three. There's only one who is Yahweh. There's only one who is God. And Jesus says, that's the greatest commandment of all. So why would we, if we begin to think about these things, why would we want to ignore, disregard, or diminish in any way what Jesus calls the greatest of all the commandments. Isn't that interesting? I'm going to just stay with this. I'm going to stay with there's only one God and God is one, only one individual. So this is, this is where we're at. Is this important or not? Well, we just read Jesus says that's the greatest of all the commandments. If you're going to do all sorts of commandments, then people do sometimes, but here we are, you're going to do all these commandments, but then do them all with the wrong God in mind. Or having two or three or another person or two with him that are also supposed to be God. That's not the picture. So good Jewish folks throughout history, uh, Orthodox Jews, that's what that was, they have been on this page all along. So we're not out there totally alone in that sense. We say, well, you believe it's only one who is God. Yeah, us and all the, the Jews who have been true to their faith, I think, over, over time, they have been right there with that one God business too. That's the reason that Jewish folks to this day, if you begin to talk to them and say, we want to talk to you about our Christian three-person God. Their, their hair may just about stand up on their head. And they're, oh, because they have been taught from their youth that that's impossible. You, you don't have a two or three person God. It is interesting then that while there are scriptures that directly address the matter of God being one individual, there is no actual 
passage in the Bible, Old or New Testament, that actually say there is one God and God is three. That's not there. People infer that or they say that, but it's not actually in the scriptures. But the, that God is one, I think you can see, oh yeah, that's there. It's literally there. It's, it's right up front and uh, there's no question about it. So, yeah, Jewish folks are with us on, you know, we're with them, however you want to look at it. They're on the right track when it comes to the one God. And, uh, and they were believing that and right about it before Christ even came, you know. And we're Christians. Don't misunderstand me, as I said. We're absolutely uh, on that. So later on, by a few hundred years, we had the Muslim folks came along. And it's an interesting thing. They were, they have their own developments and their own history, and that's another story that we're not talking about today. But they objected. They came to the thing, hey, this two or three person God business, that's wrong. And actually, they got it right, too, about God just being one. Well, no offense, that's really not hard. Anybody who wanted to read the Bible without prejudices, it doesn't take too much to see that God really is just one individual. It's everywhere when you begin looking at it. And uh, you have to actually go over here, over there, up there, down here, finding some things to argue with to say about, oh, he's two or three different individuals. You have to put those arguments together to make it happen. This, eh, this actually just reads from the beginning. In the beginning, God, there he is, okay, created the heaven. And after that, God's pretty easy, you know. Not in the beginning, three persons as one God, or two persons as one God, but in the beginning, God did this. Okay. Well, what about it then? This is an interesting question. In the Old Testament, as we say, the Hebrew Bible, they had, what about these other characters that, that seem to come on the scene? Jesus Christ, and he being the Son of God, the Messiah, and the, what, what about him then? Isn't he God too? And any Jew, Jews actually have had this understanding, concept of a Messiah for ages. That it came by way of them. Christians didn't invent the idea of a Messiah. Actually, that came through the Jewish prophets who were there before, before that. So even Jesus didn't invent the idea of a Messiah. He was it, okay? But he didn't invent the idea. So what we find then in the, in the scriptures that was believed by the Jews and still is that they didn't believe this was another God person or the Messiah was another God person, the Messiah, that was around with these people back in through the Old Testament scriptures. Jews to this day still don't believe their Messiah was really back there. You know, Orthodox Jews. We're going to say, they, they didn't say, oh, we don't have Isaiah saying, and I had a talk with Jesus one day. And he was, no, it's never there. In fact, I can't find an example where the, the word Jesus, the name Jesus, in whatever language you want to use, and again, that's another story, but I can't find where it's ever used with reference to him in the Old Testament period. So what did the Jews believe about that? What did the Old Testament prophets and the people of God of old believe about Jesus? Did they believe he was another God person along with Yahweh? And the answer is no, only one is Yahweh, only one is God. Got that covered, okay. What did they believe then? They, by the prophets, they believed that the Messiah, with the definite article here, that he was going to come yet in the future. So what you're reading about Jesus in the Old Testament is actually prophetic matters, telling of his coming, which would happen on out. They weren't sure when, they, didn't, they knew it was going to come. So you can read all these amazing things. You can read the 22nd Psalm about the Messiah and Jesus and his death. 
that incredible picture that's given in prophecy. But that didn't mean he was back there dying. It just means by the foreknowledge of God, they were foreseeing what was going to happen. That's an amazing thing. And uh, so they then saw Jesus as the coming Messiah, the coming Christ, if you will, in, in the Greek version of things, Christos. And they believed that he was going to come and he was going to be God's Savior, right? The Savior for God of humanity, right? He's not God, but he is the one God has chosen to be the Savior. All we find in Romans, the fifth chapter, is how that this poor fellow Adam got us into all this mess with, with death and dying and all these problems, but how that this man, Jesus, and it specifically spells out that he's a man, Jesus, that he is the one God has chosen to get us out of it through his obedience and his death. So this is tremendous. So I think then when they looked at Jesus, they saw, well, they didn't really look at Jesus. They were looking ahead to Jesus as the Messiah. We know that he will be Jesus when he actually comes on the scene. Okay. And they then didn't look at him as another God person or even in the future as another God person. Not that. So the only one is God. They got, they got that figured out. So what happened then is after the Bible was written, after New Testament time, Gentile Christians in particular got to studying on all of this thing. They, they, they came on the scene and began to look at things and say, well, you know, Jesus, we think he's God also. He's God too. Well, no scripture ever actually said he's God in addition to Yahweh, or he is, he is another God person. It's not there. So, but they came to that and they said, well, how do you do that? There's only one who can be God, now you've got two gods. That was a real head thumper for them. So they began to develop a new idea. Well, one God could be two different persons or two different individuals. But that's an idea, again, never actually stated in the scriptures. And it, it just isn't. So, what were they thinking back here? They were thinking about the coming of the Messiah, the Messiah, okay. When he came, Jesus didn't declare himself to be a God person. He declared himself before it was over. It was clear that he was the Messiah, the Messiah, but not God or another God person. So Jesus was on board. If you will, bring up Galatians 3 and verse 20, uh, Nathan. This is just an, an interesting verse to where they stood in the, in, the, uh, in the New Testament. This is Paul writing to the Galatians, but he says, Now a mediator involves more than one party, but God is just one. Okay. And actually, uh, I think it's very uh, interesting that uh, the Amplified translation actually says, uh, now, a mediator uh, involves more than one party, but God is one person, literally. That's the, what the, and they got that right. God is just one person. God is one. Jesus is his son, okay. He is his Messiah. He is the one God has appointed to be our Savior. Do you love Jesus? Absolutely. Are we his disciples? Absolutely. Then let's serve the God that he served. Let's serve the God that he taught then. And let's see this, and uh, we, we'll bring this to a close. But if you will, uh, take us, Nathan, over to John 17 and 3. This is Jesus speaking, and he is actually praying. Who is he praying to? He's praying to the Father. He's, he's, if you back up a verse or two, he says, you Father, and so on. They praise. But in verse 3, he says, and this is eternal life. You want to have aeonian life, not just this life, okay, but the life to come, that life that is eternal. You want to have that? Here's eternal life, 
that they may know you, I think that's an experiential knowing, the only true God. Okay. Jesus is, again, we said here that he not only affirms but raised this business about there only being one who is God to being the level of the highest of all the commandments. And now we find him here in John 17 and 3. speaking to the Father and saying, you are the only true God. And now Jesus sets himself in place here. What does he say? He says, and Jesus, Messiah, whom you have sent. You, Father, the only true God. And then I am the Messiah, the one you have sent to actually to be the Savior of the world, is the way John put it. So what do you think then? I think... If you want to, when you have opportunity, you can f pursue further. What did they see Jesus to be in the New Testament? And the answer is, they saw him to be the, the Messiah. They saw him to be the Christ. And Matthew 16, verse 16, add that to your list, right? It there identifies in clear, straightforward terms who Jesus was. So what do you think? I, I don't think this is really too hard. Here's our, here's our saying. There is one God and God is one. Now, are we somehow demoting Jesus? You can never demote him from what he really is because he is that. On the other hand, you could declare him to be another God or a God person. That doesn't promote him. That's just not true, right? So here we are. There is one God and God is one and Jesus is his Messiah, our Savior the Christ. It's not too hard, is it? And it really, it really isn't. I think, uh, so what do we got? If you put Galatians 3 and 20 in there, just for good measure, then we've just looked at one, two, three, four, I think five passages. And in five passages, you can see what we're about why we have an interest in this one God, and why we're really kind of on the same page with uh, our Jewish friends in that, and why we think that Christians who kind of got after biblical times, they got to thinking two or three is God. We think they missed it. They said, well, but it talks about Jesus. Yeah, but that doesn't mean he's another God person. And said, well, about the Spirit, what about that? Well, the Spirit is the Spirit of God Himself, the Spirit of the Father, but that's not another person from the Father. You have a Spirit. Does that Spirit, is that another person from you, or is it just you? You know, I think. So God's Spirit is Him at work, and Jesus is that Messiah. So I think, not too hard, do you think? So you could probably save a lot of time. Uh, with hopping scriptures, and you can, you know, I, I read one time where a guy put together a list, 88 reasons why the th God is three persons. And I thought, well, okay, if this was really true, you wouldn't need 88 trying to figure it out. You, you have just one would do it. We've got one that, to, that shows that God is just one person. And Jesus says that's the most important thing of all. Can you say amen? amen. All right.